Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio. Uh, you know, this is our fourth Wednesday Tucson Sisters in Crime show. We've been doing this all year, and it's been so much fun. And our mm -hmm. very first guest was Eva Eldridge, who actually, Eva Eldridge is who started this whole thing. She's like, yeah. you got to have the Tucson mm -hmm. Sisters on the show. So we said, okay, well, we'll do it every fourth Wednesday. And the very first show, we had uh, Elaine Powers on. Uh, she's a writer mm -hmm. and author, Elaine A. Powers. And so we thought, hey, she's got to come back on. And we've got to hear all about what she does, uh, more about, you know. But I do want to say, everyone should go look at TucsonSistersInCrime.org. It's an amazing organization. Whether you read mystery, you love mystery, you write mystery, or maybe maybe you're a criminal. I don't know. <laughs> Check it out because it's a really cool okay. community of mystery writers. And Nancy and I, I think Nancy, have we had more fun that we had no idea how much fun we were gonna have with this well, series of shows. I, I love it because I always think, okay, so how did somebody decides to murder somebody else? Oh, we're back into murder in the desert. I know. Well, <laughs> because no, and it's interesting how each book that develops the the wherewithal with why the person felt they had to do that and what happens after. Mm -hmm. And then the people surrounding the mystery. And sometimes you just want to say, wake up, dude, can't you see it? Because, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> because you're like, Come on, it's kind of obvious, and but it's not to the character involved. So you're like looking from above into the book, and depending on who's writing it, it's apparent right away, or maybe not so apparent until later. But it always is to me intriguing, mm. like. You're especially interested. in the desert, especially in the yeah. desert. So welcome back, yeah. Elaine. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Good. Uh, it's getting a little cooler here in Tucson, so it's nice to have the windows open for a change. Yeah, I mean, the fall season in Tucson is amazing. You know, fall mm -hmm. through winter and then spring. I mean, I love Tucson, period. Actually, I don't, I don't care what season it is. It's because you have five. You get to have five seasons. <laughs> you know, monsoon season versus summer season. It's still summer, yeah. but you get two summers, basically. That's true. Which we is have the cool. dry summer and the wet summer. Yeah. yeah. I, I love it. And you guys had a good wet summer this year. Oh, we had a fabulous monsoon season this year. Last year, we had no rain and mm. the, the saguaros were dying. This no, year, we were the no. third wettest in recorded monsoon history. So everything's wow. lush and green. And the saguaros get fat. They get fat. Oh, oh it, it's wonderful. Yeah. All the cacti are plump and happy. Oh, cool. Yeah. I nice. love that. I nice love that. Know. Nice so to know. This is really interesting. Nancy's talking about, you know, murders and dead bodies. She'll, she, <laughs> she will talk to you about dead bodies in a desert for years. She gets all yeah, into that. I mean, so cool. I, you need to start writing <laughs> something, Nancy, obviously. But, uh, you know, what you do is you, you've written a number of children's books. You talk about, you I know, today this. we're actually recording this on National Reptile Day, which I think is funny because we even had to reschedule from some technical things. And now here we are on Reptile Day talking with you because, you got iguanas and lizards and snakes and I all kinds it. of things going on in your books. And you uh, work with children, you know, children's books too. So I want to start off with where's the mystery for you? Because I know you're also a co-founder of Tucson Sisters in Crime. Mm. Yes, I am. I started out to write murder mysteries. Um, I had some ideas for mysteries that involved animals being play, uh, blamed for deaths that people actually caused. And um, usually wow. it, it was a reptile that was mm -hmm. going to be suspected. And um, as an iguana rescuer, the protagonist was going to prove that, in fact, it was a human who had killed the person and not the innocent reptile and saved the reptile's life. Well, along the way, I got writing about reptiles in adventure tales. And I kind of swerved over into children's books. But I discovered that crafting a children's book is just like crafting a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. It's got a story arc. It has to build to a climax that's resolved. And this is true even with rhyming picture books. Mm -hmm. You know, you start out with the general easy stuff and then you build to the more dangerous parts. Um, and then you, you have a nice fun closing. But it's still so, hard with kids. I think kids books have got to be some of the hardest to write because you have to keep their attention. 
because they're you, do. you know what I mean that's harder in a way and and you have to think like a four-year-old I, I yeah really okay think I can my do that mind is, is stuck as a four-year-old I'm with you um, <laughs> and because the, the words you use the energy has to be in every sentence you know you have to make it exciting for the kids to read mm -hmm. um you can't just write like you're writing for a small adult because how we wrote, write for adults is very, very different than how you need to write for children. Mm. And that's one of the reason in my picture books, I went with the rhyming because the poetry brings the lyricism to the words and the phrases, which also keeps kids' attention. Mm. Um, they, they like the flow of words and you know introduces them to a little poetry along the way. And mm. you know, it, it kind of helps their parents making a little more interesting when they that's have to it over and over i think and i think for the parents they have to go okay maybe i'm going to add a little rap in there you know i'm going to get exactly i'm going to add something in there because the parents you know and i think this last couple of years for parents suddenly their teachers and parents and you know to keep mm -hmm. balancing careers and everything's changed so with what you're doing i think that is absolutely amazing because it just having that that flow that rhythm it, we need that. And I think this, like I said, these last couple of years, uh, parents need all the help they can get. Um, also, what I love is that you are incorporating the natural world. And yes. the natural world right now is very threatened. Is that part of why you do it, what you write about too? I mean, especially reptiles. You know, I think reptiles, like I know the when I put up snake, like, photos of snakes, even alligators, people are like, oh, okay. are like, ew. Ew, exactly. If I do spiders, you and I'm going, but they do this, this, this. They're so cool. So we have yeah. to somehow bridge that gap of fear. Exactly. Um, it, it started off innocently enough. I was working at a citizen scientist with the Shedd Aquarium's iguana research projects in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. specifically cool. in Wardrick Wells, which is the Exuma Land and Sea Park. And I happened to spend an afternoon with a couple of my friends with a curly tail lizard. And oh. unlike most curly tail lizards, this lizard hung out with us. He climbed up on our shoes, very unusual behavior for a lizard. And it got the storyline going in my head about oh. this was Curtis. And you have to boat into Wardrick Wells. You can't get there by plane or, or oh, you certainly cool. can't drive there. And so he was pondering, you know, where are all these tourists coming from? And so he jumps on their boat and goes to the big city of Nassau, looks around, decides he wants to go home again. But, you know, as they said, there has to be climax. Getting on the boat was easy, but getting off the boat back Must. to his island was going to be a little riskier. Well, along with just telling this adventure tale, I also incorporated the ecosystems and the ecology and the history of Wardrick Wells. Um, you know, and when it was finished, we realized that this was a great way to educate children hmm. in a way that was fun. You know, a lot of kids say, oh, I don't like science. It's so dull and boring. Uh -huh. This was a way of making it fun. So that's what started the Curtis Curly Tail series. And then the, um, the next in the series was Curtis Curly Tail, Here's a Hutia, which is a choose your own ending book about how would you solve the problem when an endangered species, the Hutia, damages a protected environment? Because Ooh. the Hutia was, were thought to be extinct. And then they found a small colony of them on, on a little tiny island and they realized, you know, a bad storm, some introduced disease would wipe out the entire population. So they took some of the Hutia and moved them to Wardwick Wells in the National Park, where they did really, really well. And <laughs> being herbivores, they basically ate all the vegetation on the island. So, you know, that, that's not exactly what they wanted to happen. So it, I gave, introduced the concept of, okay, you've got a scientific problem how would you solve it? Right. And so I included three endings, which <clears throat> I am now pleased to say that the Bahamas have actually incorporated all three in their efforts to save the Hutia as well as mm -hmm. Wardrick Wells. Um, and then, you know, and then I went on to poaching 
and mm -hmm. um, all, wow. all of these really serious topics mm -hmm. that can be presented in a fun, entertaining way. Mm. Well, I live in Arizona and there isn't a real big demand for books about the Bahamas. So that got me started on my picture book series. And the, the first one was requested by my tortoise named Myrtle. She was uh, an adopted. The we tortoise. can't say Myrtle the turtle, though. It's Myrtle. Yes. Well, that's no. what she got tired of being called. Everybody say, oh, Myrtle the turtle. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I'm a tortoise. Yep. And, the, and then and there's, a there's a difference. There is a difference. The, and most people think they know, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who say, oh, I, I know the difference. I say, OK, give me one. Mm. Only three times have people answered correctly. They, they've gotten a true difference between turtles and tortoises. And so I came up with this rhyming picture book that it actually has nine differences in there. And, and it was a lot of fun. Mm. So um, it got me thinking, okay, there are other animals that could benefit for this. And the one I was requested to write specifically by the herpetologist in the area was about rattlesnakes. Oh, oh really cool. Everybody because, wow. Everybody fears a rattlesnake. The, fear, oh, the fear factor of a rattlesnake. But if exactly. people understand how crucial they are to the landscape, if you don't want little rats in your car eating your car wires, you need to understand the benefits of a rattlesnake. Or as, well as, as well as the spread King of snake. disease. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. Those rodents are spreading disease. Yeah. And yeah. here in the Sonoran Desert, they're very serious diseases. So, and you know, a lot of people will just look at, at a photograph of a rattlesnake and, and just be terrified. So I figured, okay, let me present them in a fun, colorful way. Um, this book has great illustrations, very colorful. And, and the illustrations aren't threatening. You know, it's, it's just a colored picture of a rattlesnake. And it is actually one of my better sellers because people really do want to understand them hmm. so that their first instinct isn't to just automatically kill the rattlesnake right you know mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to what you talked about iguanas too because nancy and i were talking about iguanas and mm -hmm. we've been in florida recently where there's iguanas and there's a no and all these amazing lizards and of course the desert southwest has mm -hmm. just incredible lizards collared lizards and chameleons and you know i love watching you know and we lived in africa in the wild uh, yeah. in the wild yeah. and watching chameleons out in africa oh, yeah. i mean that we were really mm. privileged and snakes well we have snake stories yeah. for sure yeah we have um, snake stories so but but we were oh, talking yeah. about iguanas and mm -hmm. you know i'm like well i'm not nervous about iguanas it's monitor lizards that i was yes. always like walking to school in one place that we live, like the monitor lizards came out, they could whack you with their tails. They're big. I They're remember as big. kids, we had to all watch out for monitor lizards. And maybe, I think we spooked each other out more than what the monitor lizard cared to. But there, well, there, there's a huge the difference between a monitor pretty, lizard and an iguana. Yeah, we were just I mean, about, iguanas are like 16 to 18 inches. Oh, no. Monitor lizards are like feet. They're coming at you. They, well, they will not, go at you. Let not. me correct you on that. Okay, go green, ahead. Green iguanas reach over six feet in length. Well, I've yeah. never seen that, you know. Um, my um, parents had iguanas, but they're always small. They just yeah. never got but that six big. Feet? That's, wow. that's, be that's because we don't take very good care of our captive iguanas. We think if we keep them in small enclosures, they'll stay small, but they don't. Oh. They just die. So I've never it, seen a six foot iguana. I would love to see that. I could go grab one for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, yeah. I, I um, actually. Uh, really? If you, yes. If you look okay. My, if, Everybody, wait, look wait, wait. Website. I'm going to pause this. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to pause this so you could. Okay. We have Elaine back. Uh, we paused that so she could get her iguana. Now, Nancy, that is not a little iguana. That's a big boy. Is that a big boy or a big girl? This is a boy. Um, he's a rock iguana, but he's representing all the iguanas, like the green iguanas. They get just as long. And as you can see, wow, he is over five feet long. How did wow. you end up with him? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so as I'm standing here, his tail is on the ground. 
he is like the he is like you know like hugging a cat but yes like almost like bigger in a way like this is a dog so like when i'm just trying to for those who are just listening instead of seeing that oh, that's is, huge. he's a big boy his head is a big boy. Are a, oh but he's so cool like he's like yes. a never-ending story you know oh my gosh i want to i want to talk to him, him. hello but, okay but <laughs> so he's raised in captivity yes yes I, i've had him since he was a hatchling um he uh was bred here he's actually a hybrid because he's a hybrid of the endangered Cayman blue iguana. You're not legally allowed to own any purebred uh, blue iguanas, as, you know, as a private person. So, it, you know, there's controversy on whether it was done accidentally or intentionally, but they mm -hmm. bred it with another iguana, which makes them available for the pet trade. So he's one of the few iguanas I actually bought. Um, and I had him as a hatchling. He came from California. He was supposedly shipped overnight to New Jersey. Oh but he got lost in parcel post. Oh. So it took him eight days oh. to reach me. And uh, we were afraid he was gonna be dead on arrival, but as you see, it has not stunted his growth, his growth wow. at all. Um, wow. Iguanas are tough animals. They really are very tough animals, which is mm. why they're able to be so invasive. Mm. But a, a rock iguana and a blue iguana or a green iguana can easily be five to six feet long. So that's wow. two meters. Wow, he is big. Yes, okay, I'll, so. I'm going to let you let you go. Put him back, and everybody stay tuned. All right, we're we're back with Elaine, and so what we want to touch on is Elaine. You have this big boy. You yes. guys, he's a big boy, but you talked about how you got him and how he went through quite a trial to get to you. So let's talk about the pet trade, like you're saying, because some, yes. there's good and bad with this. So tell us oh. a little bit about that part. Okay, um, I personally don't recommend iguanas for pets for most people. Um, I had an iguana rescue in New Jersey, uh, which is why I had the setup for iguanas. And iguanas are not socialized animals. They are fully wild animals. They will always be fully wild animals. Yeah. So they're not like a dog or cat that's gonna automatically like you. And as a wild animal, they're a prey animal. So everything eats an iguana. So they're naturally very afraid of a large mammal who comes up and wants to hold them and pet them and, and love them. It's just a large mammal coming in to eat them. So mm. they're going to respond. Um, and as they were talking about how the monitor lizards whip, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Iguana's tails are very effective whips and can actually <laughs> break bones. I can I believe and, that now. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. and the other part, the other defensive part they have is that they have razor sharp teeth. Hmm. Now these are animals that have to bite through fibrous plant material. And so, you know, you, you look in their mouth and you can't really see them, but their mouths are little razor blades. And hmm. when you get bitten, you'll have a complete outline of all the teeth in whatever hmm. part of your body has been bitten. Hmm. And they bit, bite hard and they bite like they mean it. Hmm. So, Unless you mean it, spend a year <laughs> trying to convince a wild animal that they can trust you and like you, and that you really want a six foot twenty pound lizard, an iguana isn't for you. And you know? and isn't that also the same as tortoises and turtles too? That they live really yes. long years. I mean, like nine ninety mm -hmm. plus years. That I don't know how long an iguana's life is. I've never thought of owning one, but. Some of these reptiles will outlive you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I oh, mean? absolutely. Um, and the problem with the green iguanas is they have a normal lifespan of about 15 to 20 years. In the pet trade, 98% of them are dead within the first year. Oh, and 99% of them are dead within two years. Oh, that's awful. Because people don't want to take the time to get the nutritious leafy vegetables that you have to chop up every oh. day. Um, the the UVB lights that provide the full spectrum sunlight that they need to be able to make bones um, are oh. very expensive. And you need a huge space. These are not yeah. things you can stick in a 20 gallon aquarium. Matter of fact, even a hatchling is too big yeah. for a 20 gallon aquarium. So unless you're willing to put in 15 to 20 years of your life 
serving this wild animal who may or may not ever really like you. Um, <laughs> Don't look at it. Well, this is, I, I really love what you're saying because it's, but isn't it about really the end of the day, we should be saving their habitat yes. for them to be wild and you can go see mm -hmm. them and go like, dude, look at that. That's so cool. And unfortunately <laughs> it's through the pet trade um, that the green iguanas have become invasives around the world. Oh, wow. So that's one of the big pushes in iguana conservation now is getting the green iguanas away from the environments hmm. where the other iguanas live because so, they are so aggressive. Uh, so is that kind of like what's happening in the Everglades with the pythons yes. and things? That well, and, and the green iguanas in Florida, those are not natives. And, and people hmm. always comment, you know, when it gets cold in the winter and they, the iguanas become comatose and fall out of the trees, people are always saying, oh, Elaine, don't you want to go down and save them? No. Actually, I'd rather go down and finish the job. They're already oh. unconscious. Let's just <laughs> take them to that, the rest because they don't belong there. They're damaging the ecosystem for the animals and plants that do belong there. Yeah. Now, I'll happily support the preservation of their native environment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, they're actually one of the animals that can be sustainably grown. Um, provide food for people, but also to, you know, have enough in the um, habit. Um, and so in their proper place, you know, and that's the problem with taking wild animals as pets yeah. is in the proper place, they've got all the checks and balances. They serve a purpose there. They're part of the ecosystem. And when we take them and, and you know, I'm guilty of this too, selfishly wanting them in my world, then it's up to me to give them the best life possible. Um, and that means making sure I get them to the vet when they need to be, making you know, sure they have- And having a place where a vet I, that, that I, can do that. Exactly. Hmm. And, and, you know, and there are many vets out there who are reptile experts. Exactly. No, so, they're not. But I agree with you, but the only thing I would change in this whole thing is, I don't believe because humanity did this, the iguanas didn't do it, that they should be exterminated. I think they should be put Move. back to where they belong rather well, than exterminated. Yeah, it's hard to do. I know that's expensive and la la. Whatever, actually, but actually, there's a much bigger danger to doing that is because exactly. we've taken them out of their environment. We've introduced them to other diseases that they yeah, don't have true. back oh, in their neck. Yeah, really yeah. true, yeah. So a lot of the animals like our Sonoran Desert tortoises that are in the foster program in the state. You can't return them in the wild because they'll take back yeah. diseases to the native populations. So unfortunately, um, you know, and, and I'm all in favor of, mm. if, you, if you really decide you need a green iguana in your life, go to your local pet rescue. Go to, your, go local to your local bar and find one there. <laughs> <laughs> Those are a different kind of lizard. Yeah, and not for kids, Nancy. No, but I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, but she's just she's okay. messing with you. But yeah, but I think you're right I about go to go to the rescue. Yeah. But it, yes. it really is a it's a it, you know we pet sit and travel. You know, as we travel full time across country, we pet sit, and we've mm -hmm. had uh, some interesting sits with tortoises, mm -hmm. and we yes. go. Like, that's really how you care? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you look it up, like, are you not putting water with your tortoise? And there's this war of feeding your tortoise water or not. And I'm yeah. going, and, is oh it going to kill them to have water near them? I think in yeah. nature, if they had water near them, they'll be fine. They're not going to know to over drink their water, you no. know? So um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And, and I like, if you're not rescuing, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Well, that that's mm -hmm. what I want to say to people and you've come from the rescue background and I think it's really important that we understand all these different yes. species and understand like we should well, really fix our habitat yeah but but educate the education mm -hmm. before you get a pet right is critical especially if you're going to go outside of dog and cat and from our experience even before you get dog and cat you need to educate yourself as kind of dog kind of cat where do you live what do they need versus what you are ready to offer mm -hmm. because you don't need a great dane in in a small 
apartment with yeah. no yard. You know, exactly. it, it, so um, it's it's about what you think you want, and later becomes a big problem. Just mm -hmm. research first and think it through. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't go get one. I'm saying think it through and make sure you have the the absolute everything that that pet will need to survive exactly. and not get and, sick and put your their their welfare ahead of your own convenience exactly yes um you were saying something oh uh, one advantage of going to a rescue is you get to meet the animal um i ran an iguana rescue in new jersey for many years and it was important that the adopters came to meet the iguanas because mm -hmm. I, you know, from the, you know, once they passed the application form, which request, you know, which asked the question, do you mind being bitten, scratched and whipped? Um, <laughs> which is the point I, I lost most adopters, fortunately. <laughs> wow. They would come and, and I would be thinking, okay, you know, uh, Joe Iguana here is, is probably gonna be the one they want. No. It, the iguana chooses the adopter, hmm. you know, and, and that's how I suspect it is for many animals, is they're the ones doing the, the choosing. They're going, okay, these are the humans I want to go home with. Um, that's so, interesting. And I think what, yeah. you're, what is wonderful with what you're doing, you're bringing them into life because there's this whole thing with reptiles and fish of they're cold-blooded, they don't care. And, and, I, think, they, and I know care. we talked about this before, you know, it's, it's it they do care, they do have feelings, I believe Absolutely. this whole thing of just throwing fish back in the water that they don't feel anything. I really don't believe in that I know that there was that dude way back in way back land that said, <laughs> No, this is the a true thing. He did this. It, it, oh, I, I really hate that I don't have it on the top of my head right now of who it was, but he was a dude way back when, this is the best you're going to get on this, that said animals were cold-blooded. And it was no, but, for a whole other okay. reason that he did it, and it was, it was propaganda. It and, doesn't mean, when we say somebody's cold-blooded, they we now, because this is fiction, cold-blooded doesn't mean they're... they're um, that their blood run is actually oh, lower than yeah. 97.8, I think is our body temperature that your blood's supposed to run at. We mean they're mean and they're a murderer. Right. Yes. And so we now take that to when we say this animal's cold blooded, that's totally, that's two separate things. Yes. An animal, oh. it's totally two, two different body types. Doesn't mean they're mean. No. It just cold means their system runs different. Cold-blooded means that they get their, they regulate their body temperature based on the environmental temperature. Exactly. They're ectothermic. They don't produce their own heat energy. Exactly. So that's the difference between reptiles, um, fish, amphibians, mm -hmm. and the mammals and the birds who are right. endotherms who can produce their own body. Ex heat. Exactly. Like so that's that. you know that's why the the climate change you know a few degrees. Means may something. not affect us, but the animals who have to precisely regulate their body temperatures each day, it, it's a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. speaking of that, I have a question for you that's kind of off the wall, but I think you're going to be the one person who understands what I'm talking about. <laughs> so when we lived in Tucson, we would walk in the mornings, you know, early, mm -hmm. especially in the summer for like as the sun's rising. And whenever we saw a rattlesnake in the suburbs, right? The rattlesnakes were usually around the electrical boxes. And we were just talking yeah. about this on a show. And I was they, going, you know, if you're walking your dogs, there. everybody be aware of the electrical boxes. So there's heat. Is that about heat? Is it about the vibration? What do you think? It's, it's the electrical energy and the magnetic mm -hmm. field that's being put out. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it, it also tends to be in a nice corner where maybe some residual heat, you know, mm -hmm. it is kept. And and it's a good hiding place. You know, those boxes it's are a great, great hiding, hiding place. Yeah, there so, usually is a water supply nearby. And that's so. where the dogs want to go pee pee. And I'm exactly. like, no, don't go pee pee on the electrical box. There's a snake in there and then there's electrical stuff. You don't want to go pee pee there. Sorry, I know. But, but it's true. That's where the dogs, the first thing they want to do is go pee pee on the box because it's, it's, 
you know. And that's a problem with reptiles indoors is many of them chew on the electrical cord, probably because mm-hmm. there's, you know, the electrical Vibes. field there's... that oh. attracts them. Wow, that's interesting. But they do have emotion, don't you think so? Oh, absolutely. And they all oh, have individual this. personalities. Mm-hmm. They they tell people apart. You know, this morning I read an art a um, scientific article about this guy who did this re- big research project that could the iguana differentiate between people? Well, anyone who's ever owned a Duh. reptile knows that their reptile can tell their person from other people. And I absolutely. had absolutely. And I had some abused iguanas that I could describe for you who the person was who abused that iguana based on how the iguana reacted to man versus woman, mm. uh, Just girl like we get with, with dogs, brown hair. Kind of yes, they, they, they will recognize, or they, before they get close enough to go, okay, no, that wasn't the person. There's enough of a look that they go, okay, that reminds me of the person who was mean yeah. to me. Oh yeah, yeah, you look like them. I, I, You're wearing a red shirt. Yeah. They always wore a red shirt. That kind of thing. That exactly. Mm-hmm. So you know that little tail starts getting ready to whip, and and the iguana gets ready to to run away. So Aww. yeah, no, they they can tell people apart. Um, I know. I believe that. Well, snakes. Yeah, you know, I find snakes everywhere we go. If there's a snake for some reason, <laughs> they appear to like me. you. I, I dream mm. about them. I they're always there, and they, I used to be scared, but like because I've always. I should be dead by now, by the, you know, the stumbling of, uh, you know, living in Africa, those snakes are pretty venomous. Um, they, they have some pretty interesting snakes yes, there. Yes, mambas oh, and boom songs awesome. and bush fighters. Awesome. Yes, yeah. all of it. And even in Tucson, I got myself into little predicaments and, you know, but it's, we always got through it and it was about honor. I don't know. You just kind of have this honor and you know, I do a dance every Nancy will tell me like there's a snake right there. Don't move. Oh, well, yeah. next thing you know, I'm dancing and running. But I feel like and I keep they saying know, just stop. I feel like they know when like I in, in Saguaro National Park, mm. you know, I had a rattlesnake go right over my boots. And I looked at Nancy and said, there's a rattlesnake. And then we went, oh, and it, then we ended up in, in a Ramada and the snake did come into the Ramada. And then that wasn't too good. That but was when funny. he went over my feet or she. Who cares? The, the, he didn't care. We, really? I mean, he knew I, or she knew. And I was like, oh, look well, at until you. We were and cornered. I totally, I for, you know, when you forget when you're so connected in nature, when you're right in it, mm-hmm. you forget your fear at times. And then exactly. sometimes like when we do, we've been doing all this swamp stuff lately, alligators and, and yeah, alligators, so cool. people are like, no, no, no. They really don't They're care. So cool. They just as look long, at you and they just, as long as you stay, yeah, as long as you stay upright. And you get yeah, away from them their them babies. Here. Don't go with the baby. Like, oh, if yeah. you wanted to go into the, the river with the alligator and lie down, you're going to, you're, you're, yeah. you're in trouble. You're in trouble. But, but they really if you're, do. If you're just oh. standing watching, they look at you, you look at them. It's I don't awesome. know what goes on in it's their the, mind. I can kind of imagine. They are amazing. Look at their, they're like, they've got all those. They're so cool. Chunky yeah. cool. scales. I mean, you we look at scales on iguanas. I mean, your baby is like amazing. Like those, no, that's incredible. But mm. you know, you look at alligators, and this is not. These are chunky scales, like that skin. They're not I, really like scales. we are putting lotions and potions on us as human beings to get rid of scales and <laughs> you know all of that. And they're going, look at me, man. I got the big scales. You you don't right. have it's any of that. Leathery skin, yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's amazing what they have and how old and ancient they are. Dinosaurs, you know. Yeah, how can dinosaurs. we not go like how can we not just amazing they're amazing. I love I am so happy hanging with alligators. Mm. Mm-hmm. Just put me there for the rest of my life. That that has become my new thing, and it's your fault because we were in, in Florida when we talked to you first. <laughs> and I was like, she'll dig this. She'll like this. Oh, yes, we go on. absolutely. Well, just, can't we just, as humans, we're supposed to be. We tell ourselves we're smarter than any other species, right? Allegedly. We are the yeah, a top. We're the top. Okay, so if we are the top of intelligence. Can't we be smart enough? To understand the cycle of life, it makes space for every species. Well, that that's part of our education problem, right? You know, is our science education is pretty abysmal right now. 
parents yeah. pass down their prejudices to their kids, their kids pass down the prejudices, you know, and, and mm. so that's why I, I felt that it was okay that I set the murder mysteries aside to, to work on books that <laughs> would help is, okay, educate so people about what you're doing with kids yeah. and, and mm -hmm. teaching them about reptiles. That is a mystery to human beings. Reptiles yes. are a mystery on, on, on themselves. I mean, it's like we don't understand their lives and and because we don't understand, we have this fear. So are you feeling, mm -hmm. you've exactly. read, how many books are you at now? Because I have this long list you sent me and I'm like, look at, I mean, we, in the Zoom background, we only have a few because like I can't fit them on a screen and let, let it, like seriously, mm -hmm. how many books are you at? This is insane. 27. <gasps> wow. That's amazing. Um, I'm waiting for the translation of the 28th to be finished and, and then mm. it should be out pretty quickly. Um, cool. I've got two awesome. approaching completion. Uh, so yeah, and I've got so many more to write. There, there are so many more books I have to write. <laughs> so who, how are you yeah. doing your illustrations? Are you working with them? Do you have an illustrator that you work with? Um, I have two locally that I use. Um, they do most of them. When I set a book in a country like the Cayman Islands or the Bahamas, I try to use local artists mm, so cool. that it'll bring the flavor mm. and the culture to the books. Yeah. Awesome. So I have used um, illustrators in, in different parts of the world and the country as well. That but makes I, sense. Yeah, so I, but I have two locally, primarily um, Anderson Atlas and Nicholas Thorpe. Awesome. Mm. When you talk about the Cayman Islands, can I go back mm. to alligators? Don't they have oh, crocodiles in the Cayman Islands or no, is it they alligators? Do not. No. Alligators? Um, well, Caymans, okay. which are a kind of crocodile. Now, there's been a disagreement, discussion. They're not really mm -hmm. sure because when Columbus first sailed, oh, by, not him again. They, they saw, <laughs> yes, but he actually did visit the, the Cayman he Islands, did do it. <laughs> the Bahamas. Um, they they saw lost. large lizard-like reptiles. Now, were they caimans that then became extinct over time or were they seeing the rock iguanas? And because oh. they had never seen a rock iguana before, went to the next closest animal that they knew, which mm. are the, the caimans or the crocodiles. So hmm. um, they no longer have, if they did have them, they don't have crocodilians anymore, but they do have the cyclora rock iguanas and they have two species. One that's on the uh, Grand Cayman, which is the blue iguana, and then the Sister Isle rock iguana, which is on Cayman Brack and Little Cayman. Mm. And, um, mm. and one of the, um, the scary things, you know, because they are trying to get the green iguanas out of the Cayman Islands as well. Um, if you want to hear a horror story of the green iguanas on Grand Cayman is, is the poster child for what green iguanas can do is they're finding they're hybridizing with the rock iguanas. So, um, even wow. with, so along with being outcompeted, we could lose the native iguanas through hybridization. Oh, species. wow. This so is, so they're doing it on yeah. their own. So, well, I because, mean, because they are ancient in their DNA. Oh, they're they're the, actually, um, iguanas are not ancient. Uh, they just they look ancient. So. No, it, it's a morphology that it's served well. They're actually only found in the Americas. So they are a relative newcomer. But what about the ones in Africa that we've- Yeah. Made? Those are monitor lizards. Those are not iguanas. Wow. Iguanas are only on found that. in the Americas and, and Fiji. Wow. But monitor lizards look totally different than iguanas. Yeah, they're not the they same. Are. Yeah, they're, very, they're totally very different. They're, it's like yes. talking about a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. Yeah, yeah. They're totally different. <laughs> so we put them all in the thing because like, you're a bunch of lizards. But now the iguanas, and now, yeah. and, and monitors have the same thing. They look like they're wearing earrings. So what? what? <laughs> okay. No, no. They've got what? those things. No, 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 no. I'm what? just putting <laughs> into context for, you know. No, they, they're not wearing earrings, but they have these Thank big, you. like, eerie, like, things, these glands like on their side of their, where you would think they would have ears if they were humans. They've they got, have jowls. The males have jowls. Go. Yes. Those round really, thingy that's things. That's pretty, yeah. that's yeah, pretty normal. But some of them have smaller, for humans smaller too. versus bigger. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? They have like little round 
depending on the lizard or the iguana yeah. or the monitor, they have these little round thingies. Now your dude has a he's he's got big ones. Yeah, that it's, sounds bad. Well, that it's, sounds bad. it's a male thing, <laughs> okay. but it also has to do with the muscles of the jaw because they Nancy, have to have come back up, It's okay. <laughs> you know, depending on what the monitor lizard is eating, you know, if it has something it has to crush, it's going to have bigger <laughs> muscles, bigger jowls. But they have like those those little markings, like like a, almost like a perfect circle, you know, that oh, they yeah. have. But that's cool. That's neat. I look at that stuff and I go like, dude, what's that? What's with that? You know, do they change Part of color? camouflage? Pardon? Do they change color? Like with that? No. Only oh. chameleons change color. Oh, wow. So noles do a little bit. So they must be part chameleon. They're called false chameleons because oh. they can change color a little bit, but not to the extent. Yeah. Cause they go you know. brown or green from what I've noticed. Right. right. More than like the bright, the chameleons in Kenya and South Africa, mostly Kenya. I mean, those were like, that's why we feel they're so ancient because they have those, it's almost like tusks that they have. Like they're just, they're, they're ancient and their eyes do that. Yeah, the, the chameleons are, oh my God. Actually, the chameleons are much older. Yes. Oh, they're they, amazing. They evolved before Africa split apart. So, oh, but they're, Africa they're is older. the motherland, man. That's it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the that chameleons is. are the it motherland. Is. <laughs> and and they they have the chromatophores and the different colors so that they can actually change their color patterns on demand. I don't know why I'm saying they have tusks because I know they don't, but they have. Tusks. I think it's just the way. No, it's just the way they have like not crusty kind of. They they have scaly wow. things. They have mark like markings they and have, they have bumps and they have little spines. Yeah. And, yes, well, your yeah. iguana does. My God. Yeah. So what's they it like? Touching, rocks. What what, what there's, they, what, there's what, patches on either side of an iguana like that's what i'm talking about scaly with the ears. little things but then there will be like a kind of a white patch that's a little larger just above their jowls okay like, so in a in a green iguana they have a large scale and that's oh. called the sub tympanic scale sub tympanic okay. means below the ear sounds and that's like actually, a drum i know i was going to go well, to well, ear drum right <laughs> ear drums that's how you can tell it's a green iguana, no matter what color it is, because green iguanas come in many colors, orange, okay. black and white. Even though they're called green, green. So that big even thing even is. It's, ah, it's okay. a scale. So, so that's how you tell it's a green iguana. Only iguana iguana have those. Mm -hmm. The speculation is that with the dewlap, that yeah. with when the dewlap is extended, which is what they do when they're yeah. scared yeah. Or, or being defensive, it makes it look like a really big head so that the scale mm -hmm. becomes the eye and then the the dewlap oh right? yeah so i can see that I've, i can see I'm five that times right bigger than you think i am yeah so and then oh yeah it, it'll because, worn off the predator ooh. that this is a really big how lizard. cool is that oh, that's camouflage yeah. that's awesome yeah. yeah i think nature is so cool. amazing with camouflage we were in garland mm -hmm. texas and nancy's like we were sitting out on the patio and she sees on the tree, she's like, look, is that a snake or a lizard? What is that? It had eyes. What is this thing? And we went it out and it, eyes. it turns out was is some kind of- It was a beetle. A beetle. And it, when you went up to it, it looked like it was a moth. And it has two what, eyes what, on the, the back of, of its the wings. It was like a crick. It, it, it did some kind of dance. I, I have to go back and look it up. It I put like, it up on- It was like three nature. inches long and, and its head was kind of buried in the bark. Amazing. But its wings had like a pattern on it, so you would think as you approach it, it was one like time eyes, think, like a snake. It's a, yeah, it's like a snake or it's a something looking out at you, a clipper beetle, something, something, oh, yeah. cl something like that. And, and right. what's yeah. amazing, click, to click me, beetle, click, click beetle. beetle. That's right, Nancy. Yes. You got it. Yes. You got it. Yes. And it was like, and we're like they were copying whoa. what a snake would do, or and that's what awesome. I've seen in nature a lot is that oh, like awesome. other animals copy reptiles so yeah. that's again going and using fear from the reptiles into the natural world uses that as something as part of their defense protection yes so, mm -hmm. so you know those beetles are probably quite tasty so uh they have to pretend oh, to be gosh something. i'll just try to eat one next time <laughs> <laughs> no Nancy, i don't think so <laughs> this, is, the future. <laughs> this is amazing though what you're doing because i think what you're getting kids and parents together with books you know i 
the whole tablet thing, what's happening in that for children's books? You know, we've got Kindle and stuff like that. So kids' books, are they on Kindle looking at full color? How is it working? Oh, yeah, wow. it is. Um, and there was a technology that had to develop because at first Kindle put all the illustrations at the end. But mm -hmm. as more and more people were creating the picture books, the Kindle technology has caught up. So yes, yeah, so all my books are on Kindle as well. So does it make, awesome. do you see a difference for parents buying books? Are they going more towards Kindle or the hardcover books? Mostly hard. Well, they're not hardcover, but paper. Mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Turn the page. Yeah. And, and which is interesting because I was told that, oh, you know, kids don't read books anymore. Yeah, That's kids awesome. read books and they That's like amazing. to hold them and they Thank like goodness. to turn the pages. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. That's I, I, I don't believe that kids don't read books. Yeah, I really no. don't. Believe no, that. they love it in tactile. They need mm -hmm. to have the tactile. And I think we as humans mm -hmm. and, and, you know, parents need that too. We need to put down the screens once in a while and enjoy that fun. And, and it, I think that's what's if, beautiful for children's books are part for the adults to kind of go, you know what, even, we need to have fun too. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Well, if the kids don't read books, I don't know how they're going to get through school. Mm -hmm yeah because virtually it's okay we got that it'll get better in time but yep. it's almost like staring at television what i mean you can watch television all night and it's ha ha go in go out what how much of it do you retain as opposed to a book right there's a difference oh yeah and and that might go away in time and I, I don't think not, so, but mm -hmm. there's something mm -hmm. different. Be difference between. Hey, listen, vinyl albums are coming back, so that just proves the whole which, thing. Which just See? blows my mind. Yes. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. As far as I'm concerned, because there's nothing like a good vinyl well, you have album. You to go there music, without you know? before you realize what you lost. Mm. Sometimes you just have to go there and go. Oh. Mm. We're still mm. waiting for CDs to sound as good as vinyl. Sorry, it's not happening. So mm. now we know that. Now go back. <laughs> right. Go back. Uh -oh. <laughs> are, are you, I know that COVID has obviously put a bump in, in everything. And I know uh, Tucson, the Tucson Festival of Books is a huge deal, especially for the Tucson Sisters uh, in Crime. You guys have a booth there. And I mean, it's a huge mm. deal for authors around the world, mm. actually. Um, and, so it's coming back up. It's coming. It is. It's going to be back. So you'll be there, right? I will, and I have my own booth, own booth as well oh. as the Sisters in Crime will have a booth. Awesome. Um, I'm awesome. called, I'm called Grab an Adventure by the Tail. So oh. uh, I encourage anybody in the area to come check me out. Awesome. Um, I'll be there with one of my illustrators, Anderson okay. Atlas, who's also an author. Great. So uh, yeah, no, it's Great. um. Very so do you have a book where like a reptile murders somebody? No, Nancy. <laughs> Not yet. I, I am, uh, okay. <laughs> I am toying with an iguana PI who oh. solves mysteries. Oh, I like, cool. I like that better. I like that better. That's cool. None of them are murdered. Well, I, yeah, none of them are murdered so far. We, we have a near murder. Um, okay. But <laughs> dig in the sand, Nancy. <laughs> no, I'm just but, you know, checking. You never know. Even my, even my tortoises fight with each other and they do oh, yeah, fight with each it's other. They do. Animals do just like, like what humans do. They that, really do. Okay, so you have tortoises. So on the undershell, do you have tortoises who have the two little prongs that come out under the neck? Yes. Like, most of okay. them do. Um, yeah. So what are they? Are is that because I, as a child, my, my dad had tortoises and, um, uh oh, she's, she's going I just down. Felt, I, I, I remember <laughs> yeah. them fighting. She's, wait, yeah. wait, remember wait, 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 she's going to go. Oh, do we have to pause? You're going to, you're going to bring a tortoise. Yep. Let me just pick her up. Okay. okay. Hold on. I'm pausing. Okay. Yeah. So this is, is, this is the, okay. oh, okay. wow. That's a big See one. The two prongs. See, I remember that's a that double as prong a kid. <gasps> because. Who's that? Who is that? Hi, Kintada. Hi, Kintada. Oh, look at she's she's pretty. She's a sulcata so, tortoise. Oh, mm. so where's where's that from? Where? They're actually. I'm gonna put her down. Okay. She's, she weighs. She's big. Forty she's pounds. Huge. Forty um, pounds. 
40 yeah. pounds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she's the smaller one. I actually have one Duke in the other room is 160 pounds. No. At least so, he was last time I weighed him. Um, but but let, let's see where she comes from. Hold on, hold they, on, wait. Wait, oh. <laughs> wait go, where is she from? It's she's, she's from Sub-Saharan Africa. And mm -hmm. these are the ones that are very popular in the pet trade because they, they hatch at a very nice size, um, big enough that, and they're really tough and hardy. And they've become the <laughs> of, of tortoise world because they reach 200 pounds and walk through walls, you know, oh. easily because they're used to digging through hard desert soil. They dig really quite easily. Um, so a lot of people, when they get large, start dumping them outside, especially here in the Sonoran Desert, where they do quite well. Mm -hmm. And they actually outcompete the local Sonoran Desert. So tortoise. this is another thing with the pet trade that people yes. need to be aware yeah. of, like that, you know, they dump them. And yeah, I mean, we, we took care of an African tortoise and I just, it just, I, I just want them to be free. Like, you know, just, it was like, okay. So free she gave in their own place. Their yeah. And, and Cantata was abandoned in a house. Mm. Um, a, the realtor who went to sell the house discovered her. <laughs> and so she imagine? contacted her realtor friends asking, you know, do you know of anyone who would take a, a tortoise? And my neighbors say, oh, I, we bet we do. Um, and so Cantata <laughs> came to, but, you know, she digs, uh, burrows in my backyard that are 30 it, to 60 going yeah. to China. Long. Yeah. And she can move an incredible amount of dirt. And it really doesn't matter if the wiring for your um, electrical no. system is under there or if you're going through the irrigation no, system. She's not going to care. <laughs> no. So you but have to the, do your the, research. The, but the yeah. two prongs, those two yes. prongs. Oh, we're back to the Are episode. they? No, I just want to know because I used to watch the tortoises fight. And I used to notice when they drew in their heads, I'm like, oh, the prongs are coming out. And then the, I don't know, if, I never knew which tortoise was a male or a female because my parents just named them whatever they named them. So I didn't know if they knew what they were doing. Like, that's a male, that's a female. But the tortoises, and they would use the two prongs in a way and duck their heads in and the prongs don't get bigger or anything, but they just kind of boom with the prongs. So is it defense, offense, or what? I mean, a combination. It's a protection for the neck, because you know that okay. is a very easily attacked part of their anatomy. So it does okay. protect the neck. Um, not only from predators, but from normal walking around, running into things, because um, mm -hmm. they tend to just shove through stuff. I don't. But think also, they the see males will well. use them. Mm -hmm. um, will use them to flip each other, because yeah. when, when they battle, you know, it's it's trying to knock the other guy over to show that you're bigger and tougher. Dominance. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Oh, so that's typical what the males. Are about. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you know, gotta use what you boys what will you've be got. boys. Well, I wanted to ask this because when, when we took care of this one uh, tortoise and I, I really became friends with him and he would chase me around the yard because he knew I fed him. I went and got dandelion greens and get organic and all of that. Yeah. But he he like would come. I was like, oh, my God, don't ever think a tortoise doesn't run. This dude. Oh, they can't. Move. They mm -hmm. really can. It's like people don't think hippos can. Nancy, you've been chased by hippos. Oh, you know, yeah. oh no, yeah. it's, it's it's a real deal. I was like, holy cow. But he also just sat and hung out with me and looked up. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know what? I just kept going outside and hanging out with the tortoise. This was, the, was cool. this cool relationship. So it's the same as like what you're saying with, you know, with the iguanas, you know, don't think mm -hmm. they don't have a personality. They really they do. I really liked oh, him. Yeah. And I wanted to give him water, but she didn't give him water. For a whole week, she goes, no, she gives him a bath and put she him in a tub them. of water, soaks well, they him, do and that's them. it. So they do, get most of, they do get most of their water from their plants. Um, okay. The only, yeah, the only time my Sonoran Desert would drink water is when it was actually actively falling from the sky. Mm -hmm. So during monsoon is when she fills up on her water. Oh, she wants pure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she wants fresh water. You know, I'll... I'll fill out basins and nap. No, she didn't care. It has to mm -hmm. actually be moving and flowing. Really? 
And this is why you should never pick up a tortoise, especially a desert tortoise of any kind, is because their defense mechanism is to urinate. This is a holdover from reptiles around the world. That's one of the, their defense mechanisms is to defecate and urinate. Unfortunately, when a desert tortoise does this, they've now given up their entire year's worth of water supply. Wow. And so they will probably die of dehydration. I have no never way. heard about wow. that. So, yeah. when, you know, I mean, because we used to live outside Joshua wow. Tree National Park and you'd see people, mm -hmm. you know, pick tortoises up and, and people would freak. And then, but it's like, it's going to get hit, you know, so put it on the other side of the road. Maybe not like just stop. Just, just ease them as quickly as you can to the other mm -hmm. side of the road. Don't pick them up, hold them, take your little selfie with them. Oh, yeah, stop the selfies. Odds are Everybody just stop the your selfie with the animals. Can we just yeah. say stop the selfies with, yeah, yeah, that's what with yourself animals. forever? Stop it. Stop, stop it. it. Just okay. stop it's it. Annoying. <laughs> it's annoying. So annoying. It's, uh, no, we've just seen so much in parks as we travel that it, it's like we don't seem to have a boundary stop of it. understanding that the human species doesn't understand leaving wild. There's a balance and we watched, we were up in the Smoky Mountains just, you know, a couple of weeks ago and watched people oh, hold God. their babies in front of elk and get as close yeah, and right. cars clamor around. And I was just, I was horrified. I was just like, oh, I yeah. can't, you know, and came back later when the elk were just kind of calmer when people are gone and they could let, they had their babies. They could they actually know. eat. Ooh, they're young. They it could was actually like baby eat. babies, but they were like maybe teens, you know, uh, maybe a year or two old, but they're still young. And people were just clamored around and this couple like take the photo with the baby with the elk and I'm like what would you do when someone just comes to your house you're having a barbecue and go wait you know what we're gonna come in we're gonna play loud music we're gonna be loud and we're gonna take photos and get up right up to your barbecue and, and put our baby in front of you you know it's like that's how it is and it we've seen so much of it and I think we really, for, we have to, I think that's what's so important about books like what you're doing with kids and kids teach parents. And there's oh, something yes, that's unifying with the, with the two getting together, grandparents, parents, uh, aunts, cousins, everybody getting together over a good book is so important. And what you're doing for wildlife, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank, yeah, you, thank you for that. We really appreciate it because mm -hmm. it's so necessary. And for uh, what you're talking about with the pet trade, is also important because it's like yes. the first thing is oh i want that that's when as soon as you talked about iguanas nancy starts shaking her head she's like oh my god oh my god i'm like don't worry i know what's coming next <laughs> elaine's gonna tell and us like, it's not mm -hmm. what you want to do <laughs> and rock iguanas live 50 to 60 years so oh don't yeah. do that don't this is a that. lifetime commitment yeah and, and, and people no don't do that they can do that they, you know? they keep something for six months and they're like okay that didn't work with for it. me and then you know, pawn it off somewhere else or just leave it or the worst of all things is let it loose. Mm. Yes. Well, the yeah. pet trade thing, that's part of, you know, when we lived out in the desert in, in uh, Joshua oh, Tree gosh. area, 29 Palms, we actually, we had a vacant lot on either side of our house. And one day, you know, we had all this wildlife hang out because we had gardens and, you know, because the wild, we had all the cats, we had the coyotes, we had road, we had everybody. All hang the feral out. Cats. We basically had like our own park going on in the backyard because we mm. made sure there was water and shade and shelter. You know, we did all this stuff you're supposed to. And food. And, but on the, so one day, we, I think we were actually doing a radio show. We we're closing up and I see some guys out there chasing desert iguanas and yeah. there, there was one and i we you wouldn't see two women want to go chase some guys oh, boy. and we're like what are you doing and they were trapping desert iguanas for the pet store down the road yep. now i know california has changed their pet store thing thank goodness mm -hmm. but this is the point you know it's like there's that balance and i think what you're doing is great because you're you're going hello here's here's mm -hmm. this understanding and love we saved whales without ever having to see whales right remember save the humpback whale yeah. you could yeah. be in the middle of ohio never go to the ocean but, but because you can of save a whale. And, and and the entire campaign over it you people stood up to save the humpback whale it's the same thing you know mm -hmm. we do not need to own these animals no. and that's what i think people get this oh i want that it, it, it's so cute well, no. Buy a stuffed animal, like right, a, yeah, get a, not a plush animal. animal, not a real stuffed support, animal. Support, support, plush support. Plush animal. Conservancies in the nature places. Support them. Oh, yeah. Adopt them 
virtually. Yep. Yeah. You know, exactly. Help the sanctuaries <laughs> and all those rescue sites. So when I say thank you, I, I really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Everyone, elaineapowers.com. Have I got your website right? Yep. Elaineapowers.com. And lyricpower.net. Net. And then you're yeah. on Facebook and Instagram and and YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, either yeah. Elaine Powers or Curtis Curly Tail Speaks. Curtis got the curly tail. Who's it? got the curly tail? Who's got, He's the, curly got the curly tail? Curtis has a curly tail. I see. We love that. All right. Thank everybody again. Also, Tucson Sisters in Crime, go to Tucson Sisters in Crime.org. And if you're in Tucson, go see them at the Festival of Books coming up in 2022. Is it February, March? It's February. It's March, March, March 12th March. and 15th. Oh, well, there you go. She knows. Okay, so everyone, check it out. Thanks so much, Elaine. Thank you.